thank you all for coming out and taking the time to see this uh, conference today. Um, so just a little bit more about what's MetaHaven. It's basically um, a very small studio, uh, graphic design with an interest in research. Um, and that's basically, uh, we do a combination of those two things, both uh, for clients and on our own initiative. Sometimes we try to also find clients for our ideas. So let's let's first like let's start with um, with what uh, Kurt just mentioned on corporate identity. I'm not going to show a lot of it. It's just going to show you, show you like what the, the the book as a kind of block, and um, the title on corporate identity of course reveals some sort of uncomfortable yet productive relationship that we hope to foster with with the idea of, of visual identity. So we made this book. It's not a monograph. We don't like design monographs. We don't don't buy them. Uh, this is actually a book full of uh, visual works, but also essays, interviews, uh, basically uh, a book about what interests us most. And a lot of the a lot of the um, uh, projects are at the intersection, you could say, of, you know, design and politics. And of course, you have to, if you're a designer, there's no sort of given thing like, okay, this is what politics is, or this is what it should look like. You know, you have to sort of try and invent it. This is a slightly intimidating row of books. Uh, where it sits between two other books. And one of these books is Corporate Identity, which was written by Wally Olins, a branding guru from the UK, about 20 years earlier. And it turns out it used the same cover typeface as, as we did. We didn't know that. So this is a picture that well, someone sent to us who used this for a kind of branding course. So on Corporate Identity, uh, well, this is stuff that must be familiar to DJ Spooky as well, because this whole idea of tax haven and data haven, this is an island that we did work on that, that has such a haven, it's called Sealand. Okay, so, but i um, not gonna talk about that now, I'm gonna talk about WikiLeaks. Um, and as we speak, there's being pins being handed out, WikiLeaks pins, they're beautifully uh, nondescript uh, pins. If you'd like to have a WikiLeaks pin, if you support WikiLeaks, please wear that pin. Uh, and they're, they're handed out as, uh, if I'm, yeah, they're handed out here and also hopefully on the balcony. So designed for WikiLeaks. So when we approached WikiLeaks by email in June 2010 with the proposal to work on their visual identity, their response took less than an hour to arrive. And the response said, absolutely, go for it. We have a shortage of such things. Uh, uh, J.A. And that, that J.A. was Julian Assange founder of WikiLeaks, uh, who's just uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, released out of uh, prison on bail in the UK on charges from Sweden. So what is WikiLeaks? WikiLeaks basically is a whistleblower website. So people can post through an anonymous process that we talk about a little later. People can post sensitive documentation and material to a sort of anonymous portal, and then this uh, WikiLeaks organization will sort of guarantee that this will see the light of day and that media and journalists will start talking about this. So there's a, there's a very interesting connection, we thought, between you know, the idea of a sort of an, an anonymity, a sort of complete anonymity, and, and uh, that, that is sort of uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, almost technical, very rational. And then there's the idea of the press. The press gets mobilized. Uh, uh, and some incredible things were leaked through WikiLeaks the past years. And now, of course, we didn't see coming what was coming like the past weeks with the leak of these cables. And this is a, a screenshot from the cable leak. So you see the kind of really technical interface that, that uh, uh, WikiLeaks fosters. Um, so, yeah, this is basically the design of WikiLeaks. And we didn't necessarily think about, okay, we have to redesign all this and make it look more beautiful or better, but we just wanted to, we're incredibly intrigued and interested by WikiLeaks and we, we thought, you know, we have to engage that. So this is the fallout of the, of the cables. There's like news stories everywhere, ministers being fired, etc. The impact is massive. So, but what, what does WikiLeaks, what, does it matter what it looks like? Maybe it does, because if you Google WikiLeaks, the third thing that turns up is the WikiLeaks logo. So it's WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks Iraq, and then it's WikiLeaks logo. So somehow this idea of how WikiLeaks represents itself is important. Um, and this is what their logo looks like. It is an hourglass um, which leaks a world to another world. And it's, it's, I mean, it's an incredibly interesting design because it's almost a surrealist painting, right? This is a kind of Dali in the digital age. 
Uh, but then it's also very narrative, anecdotal. It's clearly, I mean, it's probably not made by a designer. This is what we, all we could find out about who made it is that it is a Pacific illustrator. This was a, a, the only thing, so it's probably from Australia and he's an illustrator. So in, in design, there's two important dialogues that the, the designers should have, we think. One is with software engineers. This is a design by software engineers, Twitter logo. You know, it looks like it's, uh, it's inoffensive. If you like things that are round and soft and light blue, which most people do, you'll like the Twitter logo. So this is uh, designed from the point of view of human-computer interaction. Um, that's that's uh, the dialogue with the software engineer, but the WikiLeaks logo is an identity that's probably made by a semi-design amateur. And of course, the amateur is the other figure that we have to engage in a real dialogue with. So. Uh, rather than just making this sort of clean sheet and saying, okay, we're going like, to like modernize WikiLeaks, you know, we have to take even these existing icons, we have to take them very, very seriously uh, to begin with. Ironically, though, you know, if you know what the, was the other alternative for this logo, it was this. <laughs> yeah, this is, so it was a, basically a little contest that they were running back in 2006 between uh, the, the hourglass and this, this mole. And the hourglass won, so they, within you know, the available options, they made, they made the, right, the right pick. Um, so these are graphic versions that, 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 that of, 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 of the logo. In a way, this is like the cliche, the cliche reaction of the sort of designer with the modernist training is going to say, how can we make this look more simple? How can we make this look more, you know, how can we uh, solve this visually? And then there's also some sort of little suspense going on in that one on the, on the right. So this is like, uh, this is what Dutch design would make of that thing. Uh, and this is what a, probably uh, like a, a science fiction comic book uh, from the 50s, 60s, something like that would make of it. But of course we see that well, all we have to focus on is the leak. You know, that's the most important element of that logo. It's the leak, the idea of leaking. So that, and then we also discovered, uh, well, here's, here's a few more uh, where it forms an S. Um, and where we play a bit more with the idea of the globe. Uh, and then we also found out that, that, that WikiLeaks harbors the word IKEA. And that's funny because, uh, of course, the Sweden, the, the whole love-hate relationship of WikiLeaks with Sweden is, is incredibly, is incredibly uh, 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 important and has, has, has gained a lot of prominence. So, Wiki, Wiki, Wikia leaks. All right, so just, okay, WikiLeaks has an image economy. That's one. WikiLeaks' most significant characteristic is its architecture. Design for WikiLeaks should reflect its architecture. We'll talk about that in a minute. And WikiLeaks' potential lies in its model. So it's not necessarily only about WikiLeaks itself, but about the sort of mentality and the possibilities that it entails. So there was consequently a world before WikiLeaks and one after WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks' visual identity could be a projection of that world after WikiLeaks. So what's the WikiLeaks' image economy like? and currently, because it's always changing. Um, no scientific uh, pretenses here, just Google image search. This is like your pretty conventional WikiLeaks image economy. There's like the logo comes first, then there's someone being horribly mistreated by US soldiers somewhere. Then there is like screenshots, censored, the face of Julian Assange, and like, like maybe an, like, a, like a looking glass or something, like a, like a uh, like an um, well, optical, uh, optical tricks that journalists use to actually generate an image for WikiLeaks because they don't have a lot of images that they provide to the press. But as the, as the cable started to come out, we see other faces enter the WikiLeaks story. So here we got Hillary Clinton coming up. Uh, she's like coming into, this is the first page of the Google image search and she's already there on like, she's just behind uh, Barack Obama and Sarah Palin. And this is, of course, when the cables uh, have uh, sprung up and other people become associated with WikiLeaks. And now even Sarah Palin and, and Barack Obama make it to the first row a day later. So this is kind of how this image economy is, kind of cha is always changing for WikiLeaks and how especially these cables have changed it. And then later on, order is restored again and, and there's like this, this idea of the, the conventional WikiLeaks public image is kind of restored. But there's another component to that public image that really should not be underestimated, and that's, that's the, uh, the, 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 the factor of emotion. So this is the attorney of, uh, of Julian Assange, 
uh, a day before he got uh, uh, arrested by police. And she, here she was interviewed by the, by, um, um, the host of the Democracy Now! And you see those two women, and they're talking about Julian Assange, and you see genuine care and worry for what's going to happen to him. So there is something incredibly, uh, this interview was very remarkable, because both the, the, the host, Amy Goodman, and, and uh, Jennifer Robinson show this sort of worry and care about what's going to happen with this guy. So this is an important part of the WikiLeaks image economy that should be further investigated. So what then is the architecture of WikiLeaks that, uh, that I mentioned earlier? In order to investigate that, we made a, a, a map of WikiLeaks that is, of course, unfinished. I'm going to show that in a minute. But this is the most obvious answer to that. It's data hosting. It's where is the data hosted. That is not only the architecture of, of WikiLeaks, but also the genius of, of WikiLeaks. And we'll come to that in a minute. So this is a very glamorous Swedish hosting company uh, called Bahnhof, where part of the WikiLeaks da data is hosted. And they made this into a kind of Kessel's Kramer headquarters. Um, uh, it's really made to look like a James Bond movie. It's the only data center in the world where you could record a fashion shoot. Um, and this is their homepage. But, in fact, the whole idea of WikiLeaks is that it's not in one place, but it is in many places at the same time. So at the same time, it's in Sweden, but it's also in Iceland. Um, and we got to know more about this when certain service providers under the pressure of U.S. government, allegedly, started to give up their work with WikiLeaks. So this one's every DNS.net from California, which stopped uh, hosting the wikileaks.org domain name. So for, for a while, it was only reachable, WikiLeaks was only reachable by their IP address. And the same uh, was for Amazon Web Services, which gave up servicing those cables. Uh, so there were a lot of service providers quitting for WikiLeaks. So this is the architecture of WikiLeaks, and that looks, surely looks intimidating. Uh, but, you know, and it's also an unfinished model. No, no one told us anything like, okay, this is how it's structured. This is what we could find out from public sources. So what's the, 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 the whole idea of WikiLeaks begins with the whistleblower, who is now like right at the top where you see the drip, the leak. There's the whistleblower, and he's sitting in a certain jurisdiction, in a certain country, right? So you get your whistleblower, and then he's leaking the information, he's sort of uploading the information to a another jurisdiction where is WikiLeaks, and that we call the inner sanctum. That's where the upload takes place, and it's of like crucial importance, where is that server placed? There's a few other methods by which uh, a whistleblower can um, upload information, but uh, let's for now look at the inner sanctum, and let's also look at the WikiLeaks file manager on the left, which is a mobile actor with a laptop, two laptops in fact, one that's connected to the internet, and one that's completely offline. And that offline computer is supposed to hold a lot of uh, information too. So the USB stick has become a very interesting object again, because that's basically a method by which a lot of the journalists also who worked with WikiLeaks got their material. So the idea that there's this kind of flow and there's this kind of network, yes, it's true, but there's also clear boundaries within that network. And the USB stick is, is a moment of boundary because it's a moment when you don't transmit. You really put the data on, on like a stick and you bring it to another place. So that's like a border almost. So here are the affiliates of WikiLeaks, the, the gatekeepers. Der Spiegel, El Pais, New York Times, Guardian, Le Monde, not the world's uh, most insignificant uh, public media. Um, and the relationship with those gatekeepers is as crucial as the relationship uh, with the whistleblower. And there's also various endorsers. So next to the gatekeepers, we've put the endorsers. And then there's the relationship between the hosting. And the, so these are all countries where WikiLeaks hosts this da data. Uh, and we call this cloud camouflage. So there's basically a cloud of different servers. and um, some you know where they are, some you don't. So this is an incredibly complex and interesting architecture that they use that is really, really uh, resilient. Well, there's, there's soft power too, because there's various celebrities who are endorsing WikiLeaks, people like Michael Moore, Ken Loach, Jemima Khan, uh, John Pilger, Fatima Bhutto, and others. So they get, they've, they've got their own corner on the map. Then there's the attorneys, and there's Ecuador, which offered 
uh, asylum to Julian Assange if he could only get to Ecuador um, in time. And there's the various payment, uh, payment models which are, you know, st need, still need a bit of work. And then there's the future antagonists of WikiLeaks because uh, Julian Assange is under legal attack from various um, perspectives. One is the Espionage Act from 1917, which was, of course, entirely pre-computer. Then there is the Statutory Conspiracy Criminal Law Act, 1977, and there's the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And all these three are oh, potentially being used against Assange. And we should not forget that Bradley Manning, the guy who allegedly leaked the information, is in solitary confinement um, now without any form of uh, legal representation. This guy basically is facing kind of Guantanamo Bay-like conditions. Uh, Okay, so potentially a logo for WikiLeaks could reflect that server architecture. It could reflect the idea that there's basically various jurisdictions involved. So instead of having this sort of very simple sort of hourglass logo, it could have zones in the logo that are on or off, or that sort of flicker, you know? So that's, that's one way that, that, that the, the whole plan could, could actually go. Or, uh, here's another one. Um, I mean, we can't help that there their typefaces that they currently have are at times on Havarika. That's what they have. And we can't help that their current home base is in .ch, which is Switzerland. So WikiLeaks has now, in an, in an interesting way, taken on the Swiss, uh, Swiss design, almost. Um, so here are, um, you can't see it really well, but in the background are all the, the mirrors of WikiLeaks. So the only thing we know where WikiLeaks will be hosted, and there will be a dot in the domain name, a point. That's the only thing we know. So why not make that dot, that square, the, the sort of carrier, the point of the identity? A really simple solution. So these are all the jurisdictions from, wh from where you could uh, host or from where you could leak. <clears throat> so these are host or leaks. And that's actually nice that this is the inverse Google Maps pin. So that would be an interesting road to go for WikiLeaks if they claim that as the inverse Google Maps pin as their sign. These are different combinations or little clouds of pins, uh, logos and mirrors. So a mirrored site is mirrored in the, um, is mirrored uh, graphically. Okay, so what's a, an inter what's a simple way to write the acronym WikiLeaks? So if you, if you write a W and if you write an L, you can, you can actually almost create a kind of little visual code which brings them together. So we've started to also look at um, WikiLeaks as this set of Petri dishes, like uh, WikiLeaks is creating some sort of chemical reaction in the world, and we have to study the, f the fallout or the effects of that chemical reaction in these Petri dishes. Um, so... Um, and this would also be a way of like both communicating that, that sort of WikiLeaks acronym in a very stealthy manner, but also uh, showing some of the faces involved in this uh, ongoing story. So, so right on the left there, there's uh, Bradley Manning, uh, very sweet guy, the, the guy who, who leaked. And then on the right is uh, Adrian Lemo, the guy who he had a, a kind of chat with and who later turned him in with the FBI. Um, um, and there's also uh, Lady Gaga. Why? Because um, Bradley Manning uh, used a Lady Gaga CD, or a CD that he had sort of, he had either printed, he had either pasted Lady Gaga graphics on, on that CD or rewritten Lady Gaga on it, but he copied the files onto this Lady Gaga CD while playing telephone. So that was what he did while leaking. So this is a way in which, in which WikiLeaks visual culture becomes sort of inscribed in the, in the brand, as it were. Here's another one of Bradley Manning. Uh, so, so what we're interested in is the idea of, uh, of transparent camouflage as a notion uh, for WikiLeaks, the idea of, uh, of, a, of, an, of an identity that's both stealthy and transparent. Uh, I'm not sure if that's actually doable, but we're trying it. Um, yeah, we love oxymorons. We love uh, contradictions. So, well, one, one, of, one of the ideas that WikiLeaks uses a lot is the globe, of course. So maybe that globe could also still play a role in whatever comes out. But the third thing we should really talk about is the model of WikiLeaks. What is the model that they follow? And what is the sort of worldview that comes out of that? 
And there's uh, like a, a kind of strange idea now that WikiLeaks would be this kind of human, like a kind of human rights NGO. It's it's not, in fact. It's you know, in its traditional uh, or, or original idea of WikiLeaks being a kind of technical go-between is actually a very interesting idea that's purely rooted in technology and a view on jurisdiction and politics. So there's four ideas that are, that are super important for, for WikiLeaks. One is radical transparency. The second is cloud camouflage. The third one is scientific journalism. And the fourth one is multiple jurisdictions. Um, actually, radical transparency is, and, and scientific journalism are, are tropes of Julian Assange. So we'll, we'll talk about that uh, right now. So this is, in a way, a kind of WikiLeaks, um, you know, a, a feel that 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 a, that a campaign could have, or that the, that an endorsement could have. So the last thing WikiLeaks needs, literally, is a new logo. So here are all the current jurisdictions that are hosted. And on the right is a little bit what WikiLeaks is now. It's like we open governments, very ambitious and bold. And then it's, it's Julian Assange. And then it's like they're fighting against uh, corporations, they're fighting against government, and they're fighting against military, right? So they leak on all those fields. But is that the image that they should you know, maintain in the future? So we go on with radical transparency, actually. Radical transparency has never existed in government or diplomacy. It is incompatible with the exercise of power. So there is something that is um, unresolved in that idea of radical transparency. Is that a, a, a reachable political goal, or is it a kind of uh, radical utopia? So of course, WikiLeaks is a 21st century media organization, so it's putting out this question that there's no answer for yet. So in its server model, uh, you can't really read this, but it says cloud camouflage. Uh, WikiLeaks explores the difference between confidentiality and secrecy. So the idea that you have a hosting platform and no one knows where it is is confidential, but that you expose government, um, um, you know, events, things they did, that's secrecy. So there's this interesting relation between power and knowledge. And again, there's the, 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 Google, uh, the Google Maps pin and there's the, the, the knowledge. Uh, so WikiLeaks would favor kind of knowledge over power, we'd say. So scientific journalism. Uh, scientific journalism uh, enables, um, uh, WikiLeaks enables journalism to expose actors that obscure the human costs of their policies, like the um, collateral murder video exposed uh, an air crew firing anti-tank missiles, anti-tank cannons at, at civilians on the ground in Iraq. Uh, that's, that's something that can be totally obscured by the actors responsible for that. So scientific journalism uh, means reporting about facts instead of about press briefings. So it's interesting that WikiLeaks actually engages that whole sort of layer of PR and branding and press briefing that's basically surrounding every power center right now. And it sort of, it completely bypasses that layer. That's a kind of fundamental invention. And then multiple jurisdictions. WikiLeaks lo looks at differences in national jurisdiction to seek out its hosting sites. And the place where they do that most successfully so far is Iceland, which in the wake of the financial crisis had completely reinvented its political model. So they now have a special law that's actually very, very tolerant towards all kinds of whistleblowing and in uh, investigative journalism. And um, by the way, they're also having 500 uh, civilians rewriting their constitution in Iceland. So the most interesting political experiments in Europe are happening uh, there right now. So, uh, and that idea came from WikiLeaks. So here on the right, there's two guys from WikiLeaks talking about their idea to become the, the, the Switzerland of bytes, as they, call, uh, as they called it. And that was, in a way, their proposal for the nation branding of Iceland. And they, that, really, that proposal got accepted. So incredibly influential, again. So the, this is a kind of WikiLeaks fallout, like the Balkan leaks. There's now a Balkan leak site. Uh, there's Brussels leaks, which is supposed to leak about the European Union. Uh, and there's, well, this is an, a, a, one, a WikiLeaks page in, in, in Arabic, so that, that was also good to show that it's incredibly inter getting incredibly international. 
so what we will do, what we're planning to do, is not just you know the identity, but also some endorsement for WikiLeaks. So what we've planned to do is leaking 193 posters next week from our website, which are the endorsement of WikiLeaks from every possible sovereign country. So you can just print these posters out, and you can hang them. And there's actually a lot of these sort of Assange uh, WikiLeaks graphics around. So this is not the identity, but this is more endorsement. Um, this is a small selection of the 193 sovereign states that are covered by um, by this little campaign that's very modest and run on you know our own resources, basically. So there's no place in the world where where there is no not one supporter not like there, there's there's basically you can support WikiLeaks from every place in the world, even when you can't access it. So these will be leaked probably next week. So this is a sign that was up in London last week, and that typeface is hobo. That's funny, you know. We who would ever thought that hobo of all typefaces would become a protest typeface? And I guess that's that's, um, I mean, quite hopeful in a way, you know. If you see that, that there is some fun involved in that too. So um, uh, hobo. So guys, I don't know if you're wearing your WikiLeaks pin. I, don't, I see maybe I see one or two. Anyway. Okay, politically, uh, politically inspired graphic designers. G get that pin. Uh, so the law is not what Hillary Clinton says it is, said Julian Assange. Support WikiLeaks now. Thank you.